All right, everybody, stand by. We're about to go live. How's everybody doing? Welcome to the African History Network show. We're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. Our guest tonight is going to be archaeologist Sister Nubia Wardford. Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 a on the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday, May 21st, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Well, look, it's been a very, very busy day uh, today. I was on Roller Martin and Filter today for two hours. And then I had to get ready for this show, and I'm getting ready to also teach uh, my online class on Saturday, May 22nd, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And uh, we have a guest speaker for uh, my class on Saturday, a guest speaker will be our guest who I'm going to bring on here in just a minute, archaeologist Sister Nubia Wartford. OK, archaeologist Sister Nubia Wardford, who, who you've heard here on the African History Network show before. And we're going to discuss the uh, origins of ancient Kush and the uh, African queens of antiquity, the origins of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity. And she's going to speak to my class on uh, Saturday, May 22nd, uh, on this topic also. OK, so we're going to talk about that. And then uh, we'll talk about that on today's show. And then also, um, I on yesterday's show, at the end of the show, I spoke uh, briefly about what's taking place with the uh, African-American farmers, with the black farmers and the $4 billion uh, in uh, loan, uh, loan forgiveness that was in the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. There's a bigger article from the New York Times from May 19th, uh, 2021. Banks fight $4 billion uh, debt relief plan for black farmers. Banks fight $4 billion debt relief plan for uh, black farmers. And this deals with how you have three uh, major banks that are uh, appealing to the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, not to forgive these loans for African-American farmers and farmers of color because they say that it's going to cut into their profits if these loans are paid off faster than they're designed to be paid off. OK, you have three of the biggest banking groups, the American Bankers Association, the Independent Community Bankers of America and National Rural Lenders Association. They're waging their own fight and complaining about the cost of being repaid early, okay? So when you try to put policies in place, now these are some these are some very wealthy people, and they're crying about uh, loans being paid off too soon from African-American farmers. The question I would ask is how much money have you made over the decades with loans to African-American farmers? in Asian farmers and Hispanic farmers. How much money have you made over the decades? Okay, um, and today on Roland Martin and Filter, Roland interviewed U.S. Agricultural, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. And we they t- talked about a number of different topics in the uh, $5 billion going to farmers of color in the uh, in, in the aid for them in the $1.9 trillion mes- American Rescue Plan, but also the Two lawsuits from white farmers that we've talked about here on this show, the two lawsuits from white farmers. You had a lawsuit in Wisconsin and one in Texas uh, claiming discrimination and saying that they're not getting they can't access the five billion dollars that's going to farmers of color. But they didn't say anything about the almost twenty six billion dollars in aid they got from the Trump administration due to Trump's uh, uh, 
uh, tariff war with China and there was $26 billion that went out in aid and 99% of that went to white farmers. African-American farmers only got 20.8 million of the 26 billion. They ain't say, white farmers didn't say nothing about that. And that was in 2020. They ain't say anything about that. So one, this is an example of how elections have consequences. Two, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Three, racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. So we're going to talk about that on Sunday's show, okay? Well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later in today's show, but we're going to talk about it more on Sunday's show because I'll let you hear the interview that Roland did with uh, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack. All right, on the African Houston Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. All right. So on the line, we are joined by um, Sister Nubia Wartford. Uh, she is a cultural archaeologist, and she is from Detroit. She does uh, archaeological digs in uh, the Sudan, okay? And we've had her here on the uh, African History Network show uh, a number of times before. She's going to be our guest speaker here uh, on on Saturday in my online class. And just give you a brief, a very brief background about Sister Nubia Wardford. She was born and raised in Detroit. She became interested in geology and paleontology at the age of seven while digging in the earth and researching stones, plants and animal fossils of Michigan. After reading about the treasures of uh, uh, Tutankhamun uh, at age eight, she began. She became sure that her life interest would be investigating and researching the accomplishments of early African civilization. Now, she has taught science for grade levels pre-K through grade eight, bless her heart, for 10 years. She has dedicated a great deal of her life toward uplifting the African-American community and will continue in this work. Uh, she has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Anthropology and a Master's of Arts degree in Historic Archaeology. She has worked at major museums in Detroit, in the Detroit area, such as Wayne State University, uh, at the Wayne State University Anthropology Museum, the Henry Ford Museum, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and as a registrar, uh, which is the caretaker of the collections at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. We want to welcome back to the African History Network show, Sister Nubia Warford. Hotep, sister, how are you doing tonight? Hotep, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Good to good to have you back on the show, and I'm glad you're still doing what you're doing. We need uh, people, you know, with your background in archaeology and uh, things like that to teach to teach our people. So uh, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. You're you're, you're probably um, had me as a guest more than any other. Any other person. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. All right. We need to have you back more often also. All right. So um, you're going to speak to my uh, on online class on Saturday, but the, the you're going to talk about the origins of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity. So this is a fascinating, fascinating topic. Uh, I don't know anybody who can do it better than you. Uh, so explain to people what is ancient Kush? We're not talking about the Kush that you smoke, but what is ancient Kush? Explain to people what this is. Ancient Kush, <clears throat> me, ancient Kush is the area in Northeast Africa in the country of Sudan, which people would commonly call ancient Nubia. Um, before that, it was Kana mm -hmm. And that area of land has been peopled probably for more than 100,000 years, uh, we're finding evidence that points back that far back in time. And uh, the Nubians actually predate the ancient Kemetic or Egyptian civilization. Right. So you, usually when we hear people like Dr. Ben, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen, or maybe Dr. John Henry Clark, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, uh, and, and Professor Kaba is one of my teachers, they'll talk about how uh, Nubia 
or Ta-Nehisi is the mother of ancient Kemet, okay, or ancient Egypt, because civilization is going up the Nile River. All right. So talk about the talk about the significance of ancient Kush and, and Ta-Nehisi, ancient Nubia. This is this is so long ago. And, you know, a lot of a lot of our people don't understand, you know, Dr. King and Malcolm X. And we're talking about thousands of years ago. So so talk about the significance of this today on African-Americans uh, uh, here today in this country. It's interesting that you mentioned Martin Luther King and Malcolm X because Martin Luther King actually was gifted a Sudanese outfit. When you see him with that blue hat and that blue outfit on, looks like an Islamic outfit that was a gift from Sudan. He actually looks very much like a Sudanese. Mm -hmm. And that's why they gave him the outfit. You, now, you and said he was gifted X, what? Because you, you, your voice is a little muffled. You said that Dr. King was yes. gifted what? He was gifted a, it was a light blue kufi in long caftan outfit. Okay, light blue kufi and long caftan outfit. Mm -hmm. outfit. Right. And when you see pictures of him, he was gifted that from Ali Usman and some people who is the director of the, who was, is the former director, director emeritus of the University of Khartoum. And Malcolm X um, began the study of part of Islam, a faction of Islam that was out of um, Sudan as well. So both of them were quite familiar with ancient Kush. So that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Right. Um, you talked about the antiquity of ancient Kush. And the antiquity of ancient Kush is, like I mentioned in my opening statement, that it's more than 100,000 years old. It is the precursor to ancient Kemet. Mm. Um, the origins of that civilization came from there and probably even further down, um, further south, as well, because the ancients always said that our ancestors, in in particular, Ramses II, the great builder, um, said my ancestors are from the south. So it's a very important part of the culture um, for uh, coronations to occur. There had to be a representative from the Amun, which we call Amun. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why we say Amun at the end of prayers is because Amun was in, in a, a period of time in ancient Kush was was venerated as the Most High, as well as Neat or Nit, and you will see uh, some of the queens uh, named Neat something or Nit something, or you see Amenet, and so uh, where the black woman was worshipped as the Most High actually predated the worship of Amen, um, Amen Ra, and so all religions, all spiritual systems, as we practice today. The origins are from there, and you know there's a there's a you know I'm doing some upcoming work on ancient Kush, but actually it looks at the um, iconography of the of the church, and the iconography tells the story, and people just don't understand it, and right. so you know that goes to in 350 years we talked about the queens, 350 years that that regnant. Queens reigned in ancient Kush. African queens, very powerful African queens, undefeated. The armies were undefeated until um, Ethiopians uh, kind of came and ransacked and um, you know brought Christianity with them in 580. Okay. Uh, so, man, you've given us so much there. All right. Now, you're going to talk about some of this in the in when you speak to my class uh, tomorrow, because I know you're doing a visual presentation. Sister Nubia is going to do a visual. We have her on the phone now. She's going to do a visual presentation that's going to blow you away. Uh, very quickly, we're coming up here on a break. Uh, you talked about amen. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the prayer in okay. Christianity, we say amen. Talk about that again. What's the connection between amen, amen, ra, and amen at the end of prayers? Amen, Amen, Ra. Well, Ra is the, is the sun, mm -hmm. um, literally, the star that we call the sun, but that is the son of Nit. So an Amen is the Most High, literally the Most High. He was, um, uh, you know, his, he resided, as the spiritual system um, goes, he resided on top of Jebel Barco, which is the sacred uh, mountain that names his ship. Mm -hmm. and the ship, S-H-I-P, the ship. S-H-I-T, 
Right, okay. And this was um, the, the spiritual system that people um, venerated at that time. Um, Amen. There were other deities as well, but that was that was what we would call the Most High. Right, Amen um, or Amen Ra. Mm-hmm. The Most High actually. Yes, literally, yes, Amen Ra, and uh, you know, coming from being the star in the sky, literally was the Most High. Amen, residing on top of a mountain, the Most High. Right. Um, Nit, being the mother of the universe, the Most High, because she was. Actually, uh, she weaved in her sacred womb. She weaved the universe and galaxies. Uh, okay. So, hold, hold it right um, there. We, we're coming up on a break. Okay. Uh, hold it right there. We're coming up on a yeah. break. We're, we're going to have you continue on the other side of the break. And when we come back, I want you to explain to us how did Amen become at the end of Christian prayers? Okay, we're going to talk about that, and then we'll talk about the African queens of antiquity as well. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We're speaking with archaeologist Sister Nubia Wardford. If you can't tell by her voice, she's an African American woman, right? I know some people say only only archaeologists I know about are Indiana Jones and Dr. Zahi Hawass. No, there are black women who are archaeologists. You're talking to one right now. You listen to the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. We're on commercial break. We'll be back in three minutes. Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to two in. You can register for my entire online course. It's a nine-week online course that I do on Saturday. Some of you who are watching are enrolled in it already. Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Archaeologist Sister Nubia Wardford will be speaking to my class on Saturday, May 22nd. She's going to do a visual presentation. We're going to deal with some of the subject matter that we're talking about here to give us a better understanding of our history, African history. And we're, doing, we're going to do it uh, throughout the course. I do a timeline leading up to the transatlantic slave trade and better understanding it. Understanding this, whoever controls the history and the teaching of the history controls the future. Understanding politics, understanding economic empowerment, all that has to do with our understanding of our history. OK, and is uh, and a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So this is why this is so important. We're back from break in two minutes. Stand by. OK, we've got Shelly. We have Ruby. Who still needs to register for this online course? Now, as soon as you register, also, you can watch last week's class and the week before as well, because we do the classes live, but all the sessions are recorded. So as soon as you register, you can uh, watch those uh, uh, cl- uh, the, the previous classes also. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday, May 21st, 2021. And we are live. We're speaking with uh, archaeologist uh, Sister Nubia Wartford, who is from Detroit, and she goes to the Sudan periodically to do archaeological digs. She is uh, she's a guest here a number of times in the African History Network show, going back years, going back to my blog talk radio days, going back to uh, before I was even on <laughs> terrestrial radio. Okay, and uh, she's going to be a guest speaker to my online uh, class that I teach on Saturdays, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, and she's going to present uh, dealing with the origins of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity, the origins of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity. Uh, you can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register there. Uh, the class is on sale, $80. It's a nine-week online course. She's speaking uh, for my class on Saturday. But we deal with thousands of years of history in the nine-week course and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We do the classes live on Saturday, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions are recorded, so you don't have to worry and say, break your neck to get home. You don't have to worry and say, I can't get up that early or something like that. You can go back and watch whatever you want to watch it. They're all archived. 
Um, you can see me. I can't see you. So you don't have to say I have to do my hair. I have to put my makeup on. You know, I, you know, I had to put on clothes. I don't want to be in pajamas, things like that. You can see me. I can't see you. So I, you don't have to worry about any of that either. All right. OK, so um, so we visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information right on the home page. You can register there. As soon as you register, you can watch last week's class and the week before that. We just posted the link here also. OK, now, Sister Nubia, right before the break, you were talking about Amen and Amen Ra in the Most High and in the spiritual system in ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, the supreme being uh, at, at one point being uh, Amen or Amen Ra. Is that correct? Okay, now, um, go ahead. Question, right? Yeah, yeah. I was saying, explain how, how at the end of the Christian prayer did Amen get put at the end of Christian prayers? What's the relationship? The relationship is that there were songs or incantations um, that were song, songs. I mean, songs as an incantation song mm -hmm. that were practiced in ancient Kemet. And um, at the end of those prayers, they they venerated the most right, and they would say Amen Ra. But when Chris, when the Christian um, people um, made, copied the Bible, copied the style of the Bible, they, um, they adopted that at the end of their prayers as well. And so it actually came from Kush to Kemet and then the Christianity um, via, you know, translating these texts, because these were the oldest spiritual books, mm -hmm. and all spiritual systems actually are derived from that part of the world, from ancient Kush, actually, and then Kemet, and then um, spiritual systems from the world. It's the same thing in Islam when they say Amin, and that's where it comes from. When they say what in Islam, Amin? Okay. All right. Now, um, early Christian, now, now what we say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, just because you disagree with it or don't, or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what we're talking about. And I learned that from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagans. Um, what, early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. OK, we're talking about we're talking about before the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., before the Council of the Council down, all that, before the ecumenical councils. Early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. All right. Now, from, from, from my understanding, uh, a lot of the early Christians worshipped in the temples of the Amen priest and priestesshood. OK, uh, yeah. are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. And uh, the, 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 their their learning the, the the stories that are on the walls of the temples. Okay, these stories are going to be adapted and put into the Helios Biblos or the Sun Book, because that's what Helios Biblos means. It's Greek, the Sun Book, which we call a Holy Bible. Okay. Um, and then you're going to you're going to end up with the word Amen being put at the end of Christian prayers. But see, there's a direct relationship. A lot of times when we think of Christianity today, we think of like white Christianity, Europeanized Christianity. But that's the but the way Christianity is practiced today is not always how it has been practiced. This is something that people have to understand, you know. Um, so this this is why I understand this history is so important. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then it was adopted from there. Um, there was a huge takeover and theft of um, sacred artifacts. And still today, there was, you know, just recently uh, an attempt to, to, to steal the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Ethiopian, Ethiopia is the origin of all Christianity. And so, because, you know, you could just see how close in proximity these cultures are in geographic location and culturally. You can see how the transition over to from ancient Sudanese, ancient Kemetic, ancient Kush, ancient Tassi to Kemetic to, um, you know, after the, the Christian Crusades and things like that, how easily it was, it was transmitted. Absolutely.
All right. Now you, you mentioned neat. You mentioned the, the, the uh, winged deity neat uh, uh, before the break. Uh, tell us about neat. N E I T H. Tell us about neat. N E I T H. Yeah, you could say neat or knit. Knit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which because it's spelled both both ways. Neat, like the word, the name, the um, given name, chief, except with N K E I T H. Right. And neat is one of the oldest um, physical. Well, she's, you know, in, in, in physical form, she's worshipped as a woman. Mm -hmm. And that is the oldest known, most high that we know. Uh, going back more than 8,000 years, uh, you know, the, the practice of worshipping or, uh, you know, or, or giving her her praise of venerating me, even predating, predating Offset, which we would know as Isis. And kind of Isis takes on her personality, you know, these, these deities um, consume the deity that was before them. The only deity was not consumed like that was uh, the Shet, who always had her, uh, you know, always had her um, independence. She was never consumed into something, and she's quite an important deity as well. But these are all um, deities that have Kushite origins. And the important thing that Kush was overlooked until just very recently, and um, because of racism, mm -hmm. um, because it was, was without a shadow of a doubt, um, we know that the people in ancient Kush were black, and the people in, in today and today are still black, and because of the many different people that have occupied Egypt over the years, um, the English, the the, the, the Serbs, the, the Arabs, the, you know what I mean, the, the French and all kinds of, and the British, that, and before that, the Hyksos, and, you know, because of its many transitions, you know, they, they were able to pull the wool over many people's eyes and say that the people that built the pyramids were not black. But now it's very difficult for anyone to say that they didn't understand that the pyramids were built by black people. Sheikh Anthony Joke dealt with that a long time ago and proved that without a shadow of a doubt. Right. Right. And I have a gold, uh, I think it's like a gold statue of Neat up here on the screen as well. Um, so you, you talk about a lot about the Kandakis and the, the uh, mm -hmm. African queens like Amana Shikito. Uh, it t t so tell who were the Kandakis? You said that's your favorite. Yeah, Amana Shikito. Yep. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that, those are my um, favorites for a good reason. Um, Kandaki means great mother mm -hmm. or great woman. And um, uh, Kandaki, or it's spelled K-A-N-D-A-K-E. Some people say kin takes because that's, you know, one of the um, mispronunciation. But the, but the name, um, given name Candace, comes from those. And people will sometimes call those can the name as Candace, which is a French way to pronounce that. And so these great queens, um, Monica Shito being one of my favorite because she stood firm against the Roman army uh, who was trying to occupy, who was, you know, playing the sack it and came with, you know, 20, 30,000 soldiers. And she sacked, she came and met with uh, Augustus Caesar, sacked this camp, you know, told him that you can come in, but you're not going to leave alive. Right. And um, sacked this camp. Um, you know, took his statue and beheaded it, you know, put it at the base of her throne so that she could step on his face every time she went up to um, um, to her throne. So she's just my favorite sister <laughs> in history because, you know, she wasn't, she didn't take no stuff. You know what I mean? That's what I'm talking about. Right, exactly. And, um, she, just, um, <laughs> she just was, a, she just was, a, and sometimes people will call her Say it's either her or I'm a, a, a Minorinus mm -hmm. who is just before her. There, there is still not clarity whether it's a Minorinus or whether it's a Monica Shito um, that sat. But you know, I, I go with a Monica Shito because I'm, you know, until that's been clarified by historians. Um, but she is, you know, just just my favorite. I mean, how many 
queens have done something like that. They have. I mean, they have. Many queens have stood firm, but an African sister, you know what I mean? She, you know, this, these stories are not very well known. And if every black girl knew that the stories of these queens, it would it would make her then hold their heads up higher. Right. And, you know, it's a psychological foundation, you know, for our, for our people. It's very important for us to, to learn the history. And I also want to um, do a shout-out to our local queen, Queen Mother, Mother Ocean Dara, who yes. is um, struggling with her health right, right now. And she's, she's one of my favorite um, great mothers. Right. Right. Yeah. I think about the great mother community. Yeah. Shout out, uh, peace and blessings, the Queen Mother Ocean Dara, uh, who I know. Yeah, I know, known her for years here in the community. Uh, up on the screen, I have a peach picture of uh, Amana Shikito that you sent me. It's a relief. It's a carving uh, in the uh, in stone of Amana Shikito. Uh, now also you have, let me go to this next one here. I have one of, um, let's see, this is, let me pull this, this other one up here. This is a, a, a monitory, uh, from, uh, uh, first century BCE. I think this is, um, so tell us about a monitory. A monocle. Story and her um, husband, Pantamani, um, reigned um, after the Monica Shield, and mm -hmm. it pretty much took it to the to the fifth century mm -hmm. um, when uh, when these when the culture somewhat ended. Now, even though the, the culture was taken over, people were still practicing their own culture and their religion, probably until about five hundred AD. Um, but it still had Christianity was being introduced, and there were still people that were holding firm um, with with the uh, uh, traditional culture. And uh, a, mon a monitory and her husband were one of them. They um, were still giving praises um, to uh, Taharka, who was very, very um, instrumental in keeping the culture together. In fact, he said his charge to the world. Um, people who don't know. King Taharka, he was the king of Egypt and Kush um, at a time period where uh, Egypt had engulfed ancient Kush. And he, his his charge from his family, from his uh, great uncle or great grandfather, was to, um, is to regain the prominence of ancient Kush and to, and to mend the culture back together, to take it away from um, foreigners and interlopers who had taken the culture. And so it's just a very, it's a, you know, I love the ancient Kushites and the pride in the Sudanese people um, today um, is, is a reflection of this, this strong, um, cohesive, consistent, and proud culture. Right, right, exactly. And this is who African people were traditionally. This is who African people were traditionally. And, you know, my listeners know that I always say, and you've heard me say this before in my lectures, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. So this is why this history is so important. African history and culture gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. It gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests and our principles as Professor Jane Small and Dr. Leonard Jeffries correctly teaches. So uh, we have Queen Amanatori. This is from uh, around first century BCE, this uh, depiction here uh, carved in stone. And she ruled from about what period to what period, what time to what time? She, she ruled from, from from about, from about um, 15 BCE till about five BC. She ruled about fifteen to twenty years. Okay. These are estimates. You know, there's not definitive evidence as far as the exact years of their reign mm -hmm. because of the um, Neolithic text has not been fully deciphered, but they can read years. Right. They can read names, but they can't read all of the all of the words. 
Okay, so she ruled uh, about 1500 BC. She ruled about, she ruled about 15 BC. 15 BC, okay, I'm sorry, 15 BC, okay. Yes, to about 5 AD. Okay, all right, and then, uh, okay, yeah, because the, uh, uh, the relief, the, the uh, carving that you sent me, that's from around 1 BC, uh, 1 BCE, before the Common Era. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Kushite mm -hmm. Queen, uh, uh, a, a monetary. Okay, now with uh, uh, Kushite Queen uh, uh, Amana Shikito, uh, uh, around what period of time did she rule? She ruled just before that. She ruled um, about, was, it was right after uh, Amaneris was before her. She was about 20 BCE. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what the end is on a monetary. Um, so she, but she was quite a bit of time. We do know that. Um, you know, her brain was at least 30, 40 years. And, um, you know, a, a menorinist, um, you know, and a, a monetary may be her daughter. Mm hmm Okay, so she ruled about 20, about 20. Maybe it is. Uh-huh. So she ruled about uh, 20 B.C.? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Okay. All right. Um, go ahead. Her, you know, have to say a little bit about Amanda. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, Amanda is one of the most interesting queens. Her name actually is Amen Kush Tel, which means a god of the land of Kush. Mm, okay, a god of the land of Kush. God of the land of Kush, because remember the most. The, um, the rulers were thought of as gods because they had the power of life and death mm -hmm. of the citizens. So they took their, their rule very seriously because, as should any ruler, um, president, or anybody that's over um, people, because the, their decisions actually um, affect people's lives. Right. Right, exactly. Okay. Um and, okay, so this is some of the information that Sister Nubia is going to be presenting on at my in my class on uh, my online class Saturday, May twenty second, uh, twelve noon. We we do the class twelve noon or two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sister Nubia will do a presentation about half hour, forty five minutes, something like that, and take questions. I'm not gonna we we're not gonna be rushed, Sister Nubia. So you can you can take your time with. I know last time you you were a little rushed, but uh, uh, this time the class is on Saturdays, twelve noon. And I don't have to do a radio show after the class, so you can you, you can take your time. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, let people know about the uh, uh, coloring book that you have, also, and give people your website as well. Okay, um, the ancient Kushite, um, the ancient Kush Warren coloring book mm -hmm. is available at www.ancient nubiancities.com and you know it'll be sent right to you It's 16 um, pages of, of wonderful colorful pictures mm -hmm. and I'll also be doing an ancient Kush too very very soon um, it will be out before February before Black History Month before Kwanzaa so it, you know it's a great Kwanzaa gift it's a great gift for any child and it's a great gift for adults as well because it, the little birds up under the coloring book definitely um, help people learn their history as well. Okay, so we have it up here on the screen uh, right now so people can see it. We have your website, Nubian Arche Archaeological Project. The website is uh, ancientnubiancities.com, uh, ancientnubiancities.com. We have uh, the homepage up here on the website. And uh, we're going to post this link here, uh, ancientnubiancities.com. Okay. And then when you scroll down uh, her uh, website, when you scroll down, you'll see the uh, comic, the coloring book. You'll see the information for the coloring book as well. You can order the coloring book to support uh, Sister Nubia and her research. Uh, the color, so, so it's the Ancient Kush coloring book. Uh, it's eight dollars. Uh, uh, is that correct? It's eight dollars. 
for the coloring book? Yeah. Okay. And that, and, and that includes, uh, and that includes shipping and handling. Uh, so you can uh, purchase this to support this sister uh, also and teach your children about ancient Nubia as well. Uh, anything else uh, you want to say before, before I let you go? Yeah, I just think it's very important for people to understand and study about our ancient civilization. Um, and thank Michael and Hotep because he, he shares news, information, and history, which is very important to our people, very little um, known facts. Mm -hmm. And we were not groomed as small children to understand the importance of our culture and history and that that we are just not um, people that, that are disjointed and do not have a culture that it's very important to reunite with our culture. It's, it's good for us spiritually, physically, and mentally. And thank you again for having me on your program. Oh, no problem, sister. It's always uh, good to have you on. And, and the other thing is when, when we learn our history, when we learn about ourselves, when we learn about our accomplishments and our achievements, we learn about civilizations that we rule, it makes us feel good, not just about ourselves, but about our ancestors. It causes us to look at our ancestors differently. You know, um, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who we both know, Dr. Jeffries talks about how uh, whoever controls the images controls the self-esteem, the self-development and the self-worth of the people. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. So when we when we learn about Amana Shikito, when we learn about of uh, 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 these great African civilizations. We learn about Kush and, and we learn about ancient Kemet and uh, Abyssinia, Ethiopia, and what African people were doing. Then we go to West Africa and we learn about Ghana, Shanghai, and Mali. We learn about the uh, University of uh, uh, San Kare and the city of Timbuktu and what African people were doing while Europe was dealing with civil wars and was in disarray and dealing with poverty and things like this. You ask the question, what the hell happened to us? You ask the question, what the hell happened to us? This is what we must reclaim. We have to take our minds back. Bantu Stephen Biko, one of our great South African freedom fighters, said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. We must take our minds back. Go ahead with your last uh, comment, sister. Well, I don't think that I can um, add anything else to Right, it's okay. <laughs> but I just would love people to join the class. I look, I look forward to mm -hmm. sharing the information. What good is it for me to collect all this information and not share it with it? It's the reason why I do this is for our people and for others that want to learn about the true history of our people because we have been mistaught, we've been miseducated. Absolutely. It is, it is our job to re-educate ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, now, do you have any uh, lectures coming up that you're doing yourself? Uh, anything like that? You want to let us know about? I do not have any lectures coming, coming up. I'm, I'm working on my book. Okay. Um, and so I'm working on my book, my coloring book and my writing book about, uh, you know, about ancient Kush. And I really just took off. So I, you know, I had so much going on. I, you know, I, it just, you know, I just, Probably get up more than I can chew. I just got an appointment for uh, to be in the curatorial board of the Pan African History Museum in, in Ghana. And wow! A couple more boards that I'm on. Yeah, it's a really it's an honor. It's a, it's wow! An honor. The Pan African History Museum so, in Ghana. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. And so you know, it's just a lot of things that are going on. So I wanted to make sure, you know, with the pandemic going on, Michael. It, it really gives you an idea. I said, you know what? I'm going to write this stuff down. Who knows what's going to happen in the next two, three, you know, years of our lives. Mm -hmm. So there's no better time than now for me to create this, um, these books. And, and you've been one of the most people that, that's encouraging. You'll be one of the book coming. What's the book coming? Right. You've been telling me that for a couple of years now. So Does, I'm going to ask you. you yeah, okay. So it's coming. All right. So any any ETA on when the book is coming out? Because I've been telling you every time when I see your lectures, I'm like, sister, I'm like, where's your book? And when are you gonna put this stuff on DVD or digital download or something? Because I'm telling you, this when when you see, I saw her presentation when she's dealing with the uh, iconography uh, in Christian churches and relating this back to ancient Kemet and ancient Egypt and showing where this stuff comes from. I'm like, sister, you gotta get this information out here. Yeah, because that, now that's my own 
own personal study. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, I've, I've even read more into it than I've than I've researched. A lot of this is my original study. So yes, mm-hmm. I'm gonna put it out there, and I'm gonna try to put it in. But, you know, so it's really about three books, that, right? You know that I have. You know, but but I'm definitely going to refer to a lot of that which you mentioned, the iconography and everything. And Absolutely, those, because people just don't really understand that all spiritual systems come from um, this part of Africa, period. Right. You know, all spiritual systems, even um, the ones, you know, the ones that that predated that are actually incorporated in in the way that people practice spiritually in Africa. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The, the mystery system is is akin to voodoo. Voodoo is a, akin to some other things. It's just very, very, very um, ancient spiritual practices, and they're so very sacred, and if we just understood, I mean, it makes it, it makes everything fit together. Sometimes when we're uncomfortable adopting um, Christianity, and that's why a lot of people went to Islam, because, you know, the thought was, which is incorrect, that, you know, <laughs> the Christians enslaved people, and the Muslims did that not, and we know that's not true. Right. That, um, the Muslims also were involved in the slave predated um, Christianity. But, right. But the Over a thousand years before, yeah. Before you learned. <laughs> right. Their intention was good. You know what I mean? Right. The, the more people learn, I mean, the, you know, as they began to learn, they began to take on the layers. It takes years to peel the layers off. I mean, right. it does, Michael. I remember when you started. Mm-hmm. I remember when I first mentioned the Monica Cheeto, you talking about, I never heard of no Monica Cheeto. Where is she from? And she gave me the rundown, right? <laughs> you know, it, 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 takes, it, it takes years to learn these things. Right. Maybe, but one thing is that Michael always has an open mind. If you can, if you can show him where you got this documentation from, he's all in. If right. you can't produce those documentation, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's I mean, I've been studying 30 years, you know, so and that's the way, you know, that's the way my teachers taught me. So I, I want to know where this comes from, because there's a whole lot of BS out here. So I want to know, like, where this comes from. So before I go out here repeating things, I want to be able to defend my argument. This is something that my teachers taught me. You got to be able to defend your argument based upon facts and evidence. So, OK. All right. All right, sister. Well, look. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks, Sister Nubia, for coming on today, and we'll see you in class tomorrow. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right peace. Thank you. Uh, everybody, visit her website, uh, ancientnubiancities.com. Number one, ancientnubiancities.com. Two, uh, visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for the entire nine week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, taking place. We posted the link here, but uh, also uh, go to our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, right on the home page, uh, we have the information for the uh, online course. When you scroll down, you'll see the information for uh, our radio show. We're here six days a week, and then uh, you'll see the information for the online course. Next class, Saturday, May 20th. 22nd, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You see the fly here for uh, Sister Nubia speaking to our class. Click here to register here. Takes you to the next place. Click on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching the content. Okay. You can watch last week's content in the class before that. Uh, We do the classes live Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can watch from around the world. All the sessions are recorded. So you can go back and watch them over and over again. You don't have to worry about being in class at a certain time. If you can't make it, that's fine. Uh, Be sure to go ahead and register. If you only want to register for uh, this one class, okay, with Sister Newby, if you only want to register for this one class, the class is going to be $15. It's a better value if you do the entire course. But uh, you can email me uh, at uh, AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com. And then also uh, when you go to uh, a website, and you click on register here towards the bottom of the page. It will have where you can just register for uh, this one class with Sister Nubia. You can also register. You can still register for the class that I did with Dr. David M. Hotel. 
uh, dealing with the first Americans were Africans documented evidence because that class is archived there uh, also. Uh, that was $15 as well. We did that back in uh, February. OK. All right. Lastly, I want to go to uh, this story here. We'll talk about this some more Sunday. Uh, we talked about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered today. I'm a panelist every uh, Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, banks fight four billion dollar relief plan for black farmers. Say it ain't so. Banks fight four billion dollar relief plan for black farmers. Now, these are some uh, wealthy people fighting this. Now, this ties into the uh, four billion dollars in uh, uh, loan relief for African-American farmers and farmers of color. And there's an additional $1 billion in assistance. This is in the uh, $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan that not a single traitorous Republican in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate voted for. Not even Senator Tim Scott in South Carolina, who has uh, 6,000 African-American farmers in South Carolina. And so does uh, traitorous Lindsey Graham. Uh, he has 6,000 African-American farmers in, in South Carolina. He's not doing anything for them. Uh, lenders are pressuring the agriculture department to give them more money, saying quick repayments will cut into profits. Well, how, how much profits have you already made on African-American farmers over the decades? OK, so uh, the Biden administration's efforts to provide four billion dollars in relief in debt relief to minority farmers is encountering stiff resistance from white owned banks. Let's just be honest is white owned banks, which are complaining. They're whining and complaining that the federal government initiative to pay off loans uh, of borrowers who have faced decades of financial discrimination will cut into their profits and hurt investors. Uh, are you are you worried that you won't be able to buy another yacht or afford another mistress? What happened to the decades of profits you've already made off of African-American farmers due to discrimination? What about that? The debt relief was approved as part of the one point nine trillion dollar stimulus package that no Republicans supported. Not even the black ones, not even Burgess Owens out of uh, Utah. No, no, no. Black Republicans, no Republicans supported this at all. This was passed in March of 2021, and it was intended to make amends for discrimination that African-American and other non-white farmers have faced from lenders and the United States Department of Agriculture, which is part of the federal government. Discrimination they have faced from the federal government for decades. How much money have these banks made? Okay, we're out of time here on 19 AM Superstation WFDF. Those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep. Keep watching. We're going to keep going for a few more minutes. Right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you Sunday night. Peace. All right, stand by. I lost track of time. I, I, they got me hot. They got me going. Because we, we, we talked about this today on Rolling Martin Unfiltered, and I, 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 I forgot. Hell, we're out of time on 19 AM Superstation. But we're going to keep going for a few more minutes. I got a lot of work to do and I got to get ready for class, but we're going to keep going. This right here is crazy. OK, first of all, no Republicans voted for this bill. Only Democrats voted for this bill. One, two. Th then you had white farmers who sued because, you know, we talked about this before. California Dispatch had the article. Uh, and. It, the lawsuit was filed on. Thursday, April 29th, 2021. OK, we talked about this here before on the show. Uh, California Dispatch uh, has an article dealing with one lawsuit. Then on that Friday, uh, April 30th, another lawsuit was filed out of Texas. Now, you got white farmers crying, OK, uh, saying that they're being discriminated against and they can't take advantage of, of the five billion dollars and they're crying crocodile tears. OK. But 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 white farmers got twenty six billion dollars from the Trump administration in twenty twenty. African American farmers only got twenty point eight million dollars. Why the hell didn't you say? Any, but they're not saying anything about that. Let me pull this up from uh, the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, let me try to pull this up here. Um. Where's that article? 
Well, there's one from Forbes. There was one from the Columbus Dispatch I was trying to find. Uh, okay, Forbes wants me to buy a damn subscription. I ain't buying a subscription. As rich as y'all are, you don't need my money. Hold on. Let me find another source. They want me to buy a subscription and pull it up. Okay, whatever. Uh, white. Okay, this is from May 11th. Let's look at Yahoo Finance. Okay. White farmers sue U.S. government over stimulus for socially disadvantaged farmers. Okay, now white farmers have gotten preferential treatment for a hundred years. White farmers have gotten preferential treatment for a hundred years during when the Farmers Home Administration was created in 1930. I'm about to make this a whole class. No, I don't have time for that. The Farmers Home Administration was created in 1930 during the Great Depression. African American farmers are largely going to be discriminated against from getting loans, low interest loans. Uh, to pay the mortgages on their farms so they can keep their farms and pay their employees. White farmers are going to be able to get these loans. We lost over 200,000 farms between 1930 and 1939, African-American farmers. Okay, African-American farmers have lost 12 million acres of land over about the past 100 years, about 92% of their land. You read this article here, May 11, 2020. White farmers sue U.S. government whining and complaining over stimulus for socially disadvantaged farmers. I, I guess they forgot about the 26 billion they got in 2020 from the Trump administration that went to white farmers. They forgot all about that. A group of a, a group of farmers, all of them white, are suing the the, the uh, government for race based discrimination, alleging that the U.S. Department of Agriculture's loan forgiveness program for farmers of color is a violation under the U.S. Constitution. OK, um, the attorney for the lawsuit said all of my clients just want to be treated equally. Daniel Lennington, deputy counsel and lead attorney for the lawsuit. OK, OK, well, if you if they want to be treated equally, I'll tell you what you do. Let them be discriminated against for the next hundred years. And then after that, then come talk to us. Let them be discriminated against from the U.S. Department of Agriculture for the next 100 years, then come talk to us. Quote, they're not looking for any special treatment. If there is a loan forgiveness program, they want it to be open to everyone, regardless of race. And if the U.S. Mother, look, this is some bullshit. I'm telling you right now, this right here. See, now, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina has been on Fox News attacking the $5 billion allocated for African-American farmers and farmers of color. You know, we've been dealing with this here on the show. He's been, he's been attacking that. If you go back and look at the article from uh, March 25th, 2021, from the interview that the Washington Post did with uh, Secretary Vilsack of, of the, the Department of Agriculture, okay? Uh, I'm going to pull it up right here. This is what these people don't want to talk about. Hold on, let me. Where is that? Right here. This is what they don't want to talk about. Let's pull this one up. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack says only 0.1% of Trump administration's COVID farm relief went to black farmers. None of these people whining and crying about white farmers can't take advantage of five billion dollars in debt relief. None of them want to deal with this. They don't want to deal with the past 100 years of discrimination. They don't want to deal with what happened in 2020 with the Trump administration. OK, look at this right here. This is what he told. This is what uh, Secretary Bill Sack told The Washington Post. Of those who identify their race or, or ethnicity. Black farmers received only twenty point eight million dollars of nearly 26 billion in two rounds of payment under the coronavirus food assistance program announced by the Trump administration last April. That'd be April 2021. Out of 26 billion dollars, almost 26 billion, African American farmers got 20.8 million. 99% of that money went to white farmers. So what the hell are they crying about now? Now, th this is this ain't talk. I'm not talking about 100 years ago. I'm talking about last year. Quote, we saw 99 percent of the money going to white farmers and 1 percent going to socially disadvantaged farmers. 
And if you break that down to how much went to black farmers, it's 0.1%. Now, all these white farmers whining and crying. Why are they talking about this right here? This is just last year. Secretary Vilsack said, look at it another way. The top 10% of farmers in the country receive 60% of the value of the COVID payments. And the bottom 10% receive 0.26%. What do you think will happen if a reparations bill is about to be passed? If they're whining and crying over $5 billion in debt relief and white farmers can't take advantage of that, but you've had a gravy train for 100 years, you had a gravy train under Trump. I mean, yeah, I know the, the uh, I know there was an increase in farmers committing suicide and, and, and bank foreclosures and things like that. Well, that was largely because of that dumbass that you that you elected in the office, Trump. That was largely his fault. But white farmers also got almost $26 billion. African-American farmers got $20.8 million, one-tenth of one percent. Why, why, why weren't the white farmers talking about fairness and equality and the goddamn Constitution then when you got the money from Trump? Why weren't you talking about it then? All right, let me continue. Let me calm down. Because this right here is some straight bull. I'm telling you right now. This is some straight bull. Uh, so the debt relief was approved as part of the $1.9 trillion stimulus package that not a not a traders, not not one single Republican voted for in the House or the Senate. Um it's intended to make amends for the discrimination that black and other non-white farmers have faced from lenders and the United States Department of Agriculture over the years. It's about 100 years. No money has gone out yet. Now, Secretary of, Agri uh, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack said that he, that he notified, his office notified a lot of farmers today. Uh, I think I think they said within about a month, the money's going to start going out. He talked about that in the interview with Roland Martin today. Now, instead, the program has been become mired in controversy and lawsuits. In April, some crying ass white farmers who claim they are victims of reverse discrimination sued the U.S. Department of Agriculture over the initiative. Now, three of the biggest banking groups in America whining and crying after you made all this money off of black farmers. Now you want to whine and cry. The American Bankers Association, the Independent Community Bankers of America and National Rural Lenders Association, they're waging their own fight. And they're whining and complaining that uh, about the cost of being wrapped, uh, 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 repaid uh, early. They're not going to make as much money off the interest. Oh, we're not going to be able to afford another yacht. Oh, I'm going to have to give up one of my mistresses. Oh, we're going to have to give up. We won't be able to buy another a vacation home. Their argument stems from the way banks make money from loans and how they decide where to extend credit. When a bank lends money to a borrower, like a farmer, it considers several factors, including how much interest it will earn over the lifetime of the loan and whether the bank can sell the loan to other investors. But allowing borrowers to repay their debts early, God forbid, we won't be able to make as much money as these black farmers. The government, they, they're going to do loan forgiveness. We're going to get paid back too early. No, we want to stretch it out. No, we want to stretch it out. We want to make money off of you poor black farmers. We haven't made enough money off your backs now. We haven't made enough money off your backs in, over the previous decades. So we can't let we can't let we can't let you have this loan forgiveness and pay and we get paid back too soon because this is going to hurt our investors who are all multimillionaires, most and some of them billionaires. By allowing borrowers to repay their debts early, the lenders are being denied income. They have long expected, uh, this is what they argue. The banks want the federal government to pay money beyond the outstanding, outstanding loan amount so that banks and investors will not miss out on interest income. Oh my God, God we, we can't let the banks miss out on interest income. The world will come to an end. 
I mean, wh what would they do if they can't make as much money as they projected off of interest income? Why don't y'all just charge that to the gang? That's what you should do. As much money as you made out with black farmers, you should just charge that to the gang. The outstanding loan amount so that banks and investors will not miss out on interest income that they're expect expecting or money that they would have made reselling the loans to other investors. Sound like some greedy ass bankers to me. That's what that sounds like. Sounds like some greedy ass bankers to me. They also want other investors who bought the loans in the secondary market to get government money that will make up for whatever losses they might incur from the early payout. Um, you know, I hear a whole lot of Republicans talking about socialism. That sounds like socialism to me. I hear a whole lot of I hear a whole lot of Republicans talking about Joe Biden and his socialist agenda and all this other stuff. That sounds like socialism to me. I wonder how many Republicans support this. Early payoff, getting the money from the federal government, all that stuff. Don't that, that's not like like welfare to me. You can't wait. Hold on. The banks can't stand on their own two feet. The banks can't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I mean, that, that, sound, that sounds like that sounds like welfare for banks. But that sounds like the banks are looking for a handout. Bank lobbyists in letters and virtual meetings have been asking the Agriculture Department to make changes to the repayment program. A USDA, a USDA official said they are pressing the USDA to simply make the loan payments rather than wipe out the debt all at once. And they are warning of other repercussions, including long term damage to the USDA's minority lending program. In a letter sent last month to U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack, the bank suggested that they might be more reluctant to extend credit. If the loans were quickly repaid, leaving minority farmers worse, worse off in the long run. The intim now check this out. The intimation was viewed as a threat by some organizations that represent black farmers. So, oh, so now you're gonna threaten us that you ain't gonna extend credit if the if, if, if the if the loans get paid off sooner than you thought, because you're not gonna make as much interest off of black farmers. My thing is, I, I want to know how much money have you made over the past few decades over off of black farmers? So you just charge this to the game. You've had a good run. You just charge this to the game. Just like uh, uh, when uh, uh, Bumpy Johnson and, and Vincent Chan uh, Giagati, when they formed a partnership and then the other crown bosses won in on it, Vincent Chan said, look, we had a good run. Okay, we made a lot of money. Now they won't in. All right, that's on Godfather Harlem, okay? This is what this is like. But now you're going to threaten African-American farmers if these loans get paid off too soon. And, then they want, and, and now the banks want the government to come in and bail them out. That sounds like socialism. That sounds like bank welfare. If the USDA, they wrote Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack. I want you to see this BS right here. I want you to see this BS. This is what this is. This is what happens when African Americans push. See, see, the reason why that five billion was in the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan is because of people like Senator Cory Booker and Senator Raphael Warnock. They were fighting to get this aid for black farmers. OK. Now, now, all of a sudden, you got all these white people that are upset. Over this five billion. They were silent when they got 26 billion for white farmers from the Trump administration in 2020. Okay, let's go back to this here. See, this is some straight up bull. Now, at the at the very same time, you got Republicans in 47 state legislatures trying to push 361 voter restriction bills to make it harder for African-Americans and Latinos to vote, to put policies in place just like this. You, got, you have them trying to make it harder to vote. This The only reason why this bill exists 
is because of the 2020 election in African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, white people of good conscience coming out voting Trump out of office and a bunch of traitors Republicans out of office, like in Georgia. Senator Kelly Loeffler, Republican, got defeated. Republican Senator David Perdue got defeated. That's why you got this bill. That's helping many white Republicans who voted for Republicans in the House of Representatives and U.S. Senate. Many of these, many of these, many of the Republicans' constituents in the House of Representatives and Senate, many white Republicans that voted for these Republicans in the House and Senate, the, the Republicans in the House and the Senate didn't vote for this bill. That's going to benefit a lot of the white Republicans that voted for them. Let's go back to this here. Now I got to get ready for this class. But see, this, this, this it, it, now, now at the very same time, you have, you got to connect the dots on all this. At the very same time, you have Republicans in Idaho, Iowa, different states like this, passing bills to ban teaching about critical race theory, to, to, to control what's being taught about racism, systemic racism, and slavery in schools. They're trying to control the teaching of the history of the past and control who can vote to put policies in place in the future to change the trajectory of the country. They're trying to box us in from both sides. If our vote didn't matter, why are Republicans working so hard to suppress our vote? And then they want to control what's being taught about the past so they can control the trajectory trajectory of the future as well. See, these are, these are some demons right here. These are straight up demons. Now, some people may say, oh, you shouldn't call them demons. Okay, well, give me a better name for them then. Well, well, well you know, give me a better name for them and, and we'll try that one out. Uh, also, read this article because I've done uh, we've done some shows dealing with critical race theory. Read this article right here. NBCNews.com, how Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools. Republican lawmakers across the country have proposed bills to ban critical race theory in K through 12 schools. Here's what that really means. Now, there's no real effort to teach critical race theory at, at the high school level, middle school, high school. That's usually taught at the at the college level. Graduate school and law school, critical race theory. Okay, that's not taught. In, they, you don't teach that in high schools and things like that. There's no effort to uh, the, the teach it in high schools. They're just using this as a rallying point because they don't have any beneficial policies for uh, 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 to, to, to uh, promote. So they're dealing with cultural issues. Read this article here from uh, Black News Channel. We talked about it here on this show. Representative Vernon Jones wants to ban critical race theory, can't define what it is. Vernon Jones got exposed by uh, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill on uh, Mark Lamont Hill show on the Black News Channel. Uh, Vernon Jones, former uh, state representative, Democratic state representative in Georgia. Then he became a Republican. Even as a Democrat, he was a big Trump supporter. He's a dumbass. He's running for governor of Georgia. He's not going to be Stacey Abrams. He's running for governor of Georgia. Part of his platform is if he becomes governor, he's, he said he's going to do an executive order to ban critical race theory. When he was asked a number of times by Dr. Mark Lamont, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill to please define for me what critical race theory is. Vernon Jones can tell you what crit critical race theory is like most Republicans. They have no clue what it is. Critical race theory is a legal analysis on the premise that race is a social construct that is used to oppress people rather than a natural biological feature. Race is not a natural bio bi biological feature. They're talking about understanding racism as a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. And, and racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity. And they use this to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. 
So they're understanding racism from this from this perspective and how the laws are being used to perpetuate racism. This is what critical race theory is, is breaking down. OK, well, you, Republicans don't want this stuff being taught. You letting the cat out the bag. You giving away the magician's tricks. You can't we can't have that happen. So re read this article here from Black News Channel. Um, let me go back to this one here from Diddle with the Bankers. I'm going to wrap this up here in just a minute. How's everybody doing? Who still needs to register for uh, the online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Our guest speaker Saturday, uh, May 22nd, will be archaeologist uh, Sister Nubia Wartford. Well, we posted, we posted a link right here. As soon as you register, you can watch last Saturday's class. Uh, let me go back to this and wrap this up. We'll talk about this some more on Sunday show because this is deep. You have to hear the interview that uh, Roland did with uh, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack. All right. Now, see, all this ties into history, understanding the, discrimin the 100 years of discrimination against African-American farmers and, and, and we losing 92 percent of our land, all this stuff, all this deals with history. So by allowing borrowers to repay their debts early, the lenders are being denied income they have long expected, they argue. Uh, the banks want the government to bail them out. OK. And, and you know, now no Republican is going to call this socialism. All right. When you have a child tax credit for children in poverty, Republicans want to call that socialism. When the banks want the federal government to bail them out, that's not called socialism. Um, bank lobbyists in letters and virtual meetings have been asking the Agriculture Department to make changes to the repayment program. In a letter sent to Tom Vilsack, the Agriculture Secretary, the banks suggested they might be more reluctant to extend credit if the loans were quickly repaid, leaving minority farmers worse, worse off in the long run. I guess they, they I mean, they, they're showing they have no heart. They're showing they have no heart. The, the intimation was viewed as a threat by some organizations that represent black farmers. Uh, the USDA has shown no inclination to reverse course. That's right. Stay with the course. Don't, don't, don't give me, don't give in to these threats from, from these uh, bankers that have already made enough money off of African-American farmers. An agency official said that obliging the banks would put an undue burden on taxpayers and that the law did not allow the agency to pay interest costs or reimburse secondary market investors. This sounds like they want a handout. This sounds like bankers want welfare. The agency hopes to be able to begin the debt relief process in the coming weeks, according to the official who requested anonymity because they were not authorized to comment on the program. All right, read the rest of this here about uh, whining ass bankers whining and crying they want they want to bail out from the government okay uh you know they, they should pull themselves up by their own bootstraps okay stop begging that stop begging for welfare stop begging for socialism this is the land of capitalism you you want socialism you should leave the country go to a socialist country if you want socialism okay that, that's what they should do um, read this article here from New York Times. We'll talk about this Sunday. So we'll talk about it some more Sunday. Banks fight four billion dollar debt relief plan for black farmers. White farmers got twenty six billion dollars. They weren't nobody was crying. OK, people, you know, it, the, the, I'm, I'm, the, the white farmers who are suing now crime discrimination. I wonder if they got any of the twenty six billion dollars from the Trump administration and with the white farmers. Okay, look, hey, we, uh, if you like this type of information, also you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're here uh, six days a week. 
uh, Monday through Friday, not, uh, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, and we're here Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. East, Eastern Standard Time. So uh, when you support the African History Network that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, uh, keep broadcasting six days a week, pay some of the bills, et cetera. Be sure to register for my online course uh, on Saturdays, and uh, we'll talk to you Sunday. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you later. Peace. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One-on-One -on -one Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313-645-4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com that's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com you can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com bhistory101 at yahoo.com we all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade what happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow the cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstee.com. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, president and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc 